All right. Fantastic. Okay. Does that seem stable? It does. Okay. Hello, folks online. We'll be getting started in a moment. serve as the executive director of Disability Justice Network of Ontario. Um, my uh, overall kind of description is that I'm a uh, relatively short, uh, wobbly, uh, white passing man with relatively short uh, black, blonde, black brown hair uh, with glasses and I'm currently wearing a pan and a So we welcome to this gathering of uh, disabled communities across the region. We are gathering today, as we know our communities are faced with an all sides assault from the Ford government here in so-called Ontario. And we will discuss in the next little bit um, that every single social service and structure on which uh, disabled people intersect and rely on are directly under threat. We've been here before, and the crises of past governments have only been built on for decades. But before we can fully center ourselves, let's take a moment uh, to remember the responsibilities we share to the land on which we stand. So we want to begin by honoring the land on which we live and the nations which have been stewards of this place since time and memorial. Toronto is the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territories of many nations. These include the Chippewa, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. These treaties are covered by, or these territories are covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and uh, the Williams Treaty, signed with the Mississaugas and Chippewa groups. Toronto today is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis nations, and Métis folks, and our part as, as part of the disability justice movement within these territories, we acknowledge the power and responsibility that we have to uphold indigenous peoples and nations' rights uh, and self-determination and jurisdiction. This is in particular the case, friends, when we think about the uh, Grassy Narrows River Run that just took place previously. Many of us were part of the overall river run, were part of advocacy on that space that has been since defamed by this government. In particular, when we're looking at the mass amounts of methylmercury poisoning that are still ongoing at Grassy Narrows. So folks, we ask at this time that each of you take a quiet moment to reflect on the actions that you can take to learn more 
and meaningfully support indigenous nations' struggles for justice with equally active and meaningful relationships with indigenous nations in these territories. So friends, I hope that started us off in a good way. I want to next run through some of the access items that we have here for folks. So we do have some snacks, uh, water over here on the table uh, behind folks. Uh, that's uh, next to the TTC sign. Um, we also do have folks who are filming today um, with media and with the documentary crew. So please, if folks are uh, not wanting to be on camera, please indicate that and we'll try to work around those areas. There's also washrooms in the nearest building, as well as a TTC entrance, though the accessible entrance, I believe, is slightly further to the north. So then, friends, I want to get us started by uh, first centering some of the most impacted by the actions of the Ford government against disabled people across these territories, disabled prisoners. In December 2023, nearly 200 prisoners were tortured and humiliated by guards in the so-called Institutional Crisis Intervention Team at ICIT, and that's at Maplehurst Correctional Complex in Milton, Ontario. Now these actions were taken in response to escalating tensions in the prison and are part of a wider system of abuses of power against disabled, racialized, and remanded prisoners, among others, at Maplehurst. Shame! Shame! Further, between January and March 2024, prisoners informed the ministry about the violence, the degradation, and the human rights violations that were occurring with increasing frequency at Maplehurst. Now, we know that prisons are sites of disablement, having life expectancy, creating disabilities, and worsening existing ones from brain injuries to respiratory issues or mold of Maplehurst, to gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, and diabetes from the diet that folks are given in the prison system, as well as a lack of medication access. Not only are prison sites of disablement, but they're also sites of death. At least 45 prisoners have died at Maplehurst since 2000, four in a week and a half period, this past February alone. And so this is the reality of incarceration for disabled people in Ontario. One of violence, isolation, and further disablement. However, these same realities have been present in all forms of incarceration, perpetuated by Ontario against disabled people. Be that long-term care facilities, which have always similarly been sites of violence and death as was brought into wider light for most of the public during the earlier stages of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Or we can look further back into spaces like the Huronia Regional Center and other asylums which swallowed up generations of disabled children, youth, adults, and seniors. We hold such histories in our hearts, friends especially for racialized black and indigenous communities of what forced isolation, confinement, and indoctrination can look like by the state. It is, after all, only days until we look into the continuing legacy of colonial depravity of the residential school system and the related institutions which set into motion to eradicate whole nations and separate our siblings here on these territories from our cultures and ways of being. With this all in mind, can we be surprised then that this government is open to considering all options when it comes to creating and reinforcing a whole new wave of involuntary care? What a perverse way of talking about incarcerating drug users and disabled people, and in particular, as we know will happen, black, indigenous, and racialized disabled people. We know through all the means they've used before, 
what they mean to do again. This is an eliminationist eugenics agenda and a means to target all of these intersecting communities once again. To wrap around on this, folks, let's not forget that in British Columbia, at least one proposed location for this new forced treatment regime will be co-located in an existing prison. These struggles are but one, my friends. And I know that will become clearer as we go through today. So then, with this in mind, friends, thank you for listening to me in this introduction. But I now want to turn things over to Maja, who will read a statement from the Ontario Disability Coalition.
again on behalf of Sherry Caldwell and the Ontario Disability Coalition. Thank you so much, and friends, I now want to turn things over to uh, Ariel from Toronto Disability Pride March. Hi, I'm Ariel. I am a fat Arab femme person with light olive skin, brown curly hair, and I am sitting in a bright orange electric wheelchair. So, from the destruction of the Green Belt to the destru destruction of Ontario Place to the Canadian disability benefit that the province still cannot guarantee will not be clawed back, to the response to Grassy Narrow's call for justice with anti-Palestinian racism, for it has been a disaster for this province. Surrounding COVID, wastewater testing has been stopped, eliminating our ability to determine COVID levels. Further reducing our ability to protect ourselves, the province has refused to buy any Novavax, the protein-based COVID vaccine that is the only type of vaccine many immunocompromised people like myself can take without devastating flare-ups of our existing conditions. Finally, the reason I agreed to be here today, Ford, through rezoning, is forcing most safe consumption sites in the province to close. I spent the better part of the last 10 years living in St. Clair's multi-faith housing, a place where I watched many of my friends and neighbors die of preventable ODs. I have watched in real time as the rates of ODs have increased exponentially since COVID. Between the toxic drug supply, paramedic understaffing and underfunding, and the prison-like policies at affordable housing buildings, that restrict people's abilities to use together and slow down paramedics' response times. The closure of safe consumption sites around this city will be a slaughter. People will die because of this decision, and their bodies will be collected in the dead of night. Just because it is hidden to you by design does not mean this will not kill many people. Loved, amazing people who have every right not just to survive, but to thrive. In response, more and more prominent politicians are talking about forced treatment, which make no mistake is reinstitutionalization. We are living in a province where people who desperately want treatment can't get more than a four day detox, where there is zero rehab beds available, and people are turned away from ERs regularly. The push for forced treatment is nothing more than an attempt to make an industry surrounding those who don't contribute to capitalism in an acceptable way under the guise of safety. We come together today as a group of disabled people who are still fighting to deinstitutionalize ourselves, to tell the province and the politicians, how fucking dare you? We are not expendable, we are not disposable, and we will not be further institutionalized for your false perceptions of safety. Thank you. Where did Brad go? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, friends. Thank you so much, Ariel. I'm now going to pass things to uh, Chiara Padovani, uh, who's a founding organizer with uh, York uh, Southwest and Tenant Union and a food bank worker with North York Harvest Food Bank. Thank you, thank you. My name is Chiara Padovani and I'm the co-chair of the York Southwest and Tenant Union and I am so proud 
to be standing in solidarity with my friends at the ODSB Action Coalition, OPER Toronto, Disability Justice Network of Ontario, and every single person in this province receiving social assistance to demand an end to legislated poverty and real rent control now. Yeah, give it up, give it up, make them hear you, make them hear you. At the York Southwest Tenant Union, we know our members receiving social assistance haven't seen a real raise in decades. Yay! But you know what has been increasing at an astronomical rate? The cost of rent, the cost of food, and the cost of living. The math just doesn't add up. And as a result, we are getting squeezed out of our homes. It is becoming more and more difficult to afford a roof over our head and food on the table. And on social assistance, whether that is OW or ODSP, it is nearly impossible. But you know this already. I don't need to tell you that the math just isn't adding up. I don't need to tell you that the Ford government's cuts are attacking us the most, that he's making it harder and harder for each and every one of us. But there are three things I want to tell you from the experience of our tenant union, because God knows it's getting tough up there. And the first thing I want to share with you is that you are not alone. My friends, I know, I know it can feel awfully lonely out there, but I'm here to tell you that you are not alone. You, you are not the only person worrying about making rent at the end of the month. You are not the only person dealing with an elevator that never works in your building. You are not alone. I can guarantee you that your neighbor next door, that your neighbor down the hall, that the person right next to you has faced those challenges too. So I want you to know that you are not alone. These problems are not yours alone, and these problems are not individual problems. They are not individual shortcomings or failures. These problems are systemic. They are systemic failures. Which brings me to the second thing I want to share with you. And that is we are stronger together. Give it up. We are stronger together. If you are not the only person worried about making rent at the end of the month, or an eviction hearing over your head, or an apartment and a home that is completely unsuitable to live in, then you don't deal with that by yourself. You get together with your neighbors and your colleagues and your peers and your friends, and heck, you get together with the person right next to you, and you take that on together, because we are stronger together. And finally, the third thing I wanna share with you, and this one's the most important, is that when we fight together, we win together. And now I know, I know. Some of you might be thinking, oh my goodness, here's Kiara going on again. And I'm not just saying that when we fight together, we win together to be inspiring or to get a cheer out of you, because I keep the receipts of every victory we have won together. Every victory we have won together by everyday people like us coming together and demanding better. And I want to give you one example, just one example. 
But I gotta tell you, I've got many, but I know you guys are gonna take the mic away from me soon. So I'm gonna give you one example, and this example happened just last week. When hundreds of neighbors had been ignored by their landlord in two high-rise buildings in the northwest of Toronto, that their homes were falling into a state of disrepair so bad that Canada Post refused to deliver mail into the building because it was unsafe for their workers to work in. Our neighbors in those buildings didn't throw their hands up and say, oh God, this is just the way things are and we just got a deal. Hell no. They got together. Regular, everyday people got together and demanded better. They drew a line in the sand when the government refused to, when their landlord continued to ignore them. They drew that line themselves and they went on a rent strike for 10 months. 10 months, they withheld their rent. And when their landlord, when their landlord tried to evict every single one of them, tick them off one by one, they didn't quit. They didn't start fending for themselves. They stood together and stayed together. And just last week, they won their rent strike with over 100 tenants getting every single repair they deserved in their units. We're talking about holes were fixed, elevators got upgrades, entire kitchens were renovated. These were 100 tenants that had been ignored for years and they took action together and they won. So my friends, when we fight together, we win together. And I gotta say, I am so proud to be fighting alongside each and every one of you. You are not alone, we are stronger together, and when we fight together, we win together. But here's the thing. I also got a message for Mr. Dougie and all his friends in the Ministry of Social Services, Children and Family, and I'm gonna need your help to make sure they hear us. Can you guys repeat after me, sign after me? Raise the rates! 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 Rent control now! Rent control now! Rent control now! Rent control now! And disability poverty! And disability poverty! And disability poverty! And disability poverty! Disability poverty! And disability poverty! Thank you, thank you so much. We are with you 100%. Your fight is our fight, and justice here, justice for everyone today. Thank you so much. All right, friends. Thank you so much, Kiara. And, um, Thank you all so much for being here, friends. I really appreciate this wonderful crowd we've got going here outside of the uh, Ministry of Children and Community Services office here. You know, there's, uh, there's so much that we could say about this ministry and about uh, the broader Ford government. You know, and we've been talking to folks along the way here. You know, folks have brought up uh, Doug Ford's broader comments about ODSP and about uh, you know our communities and uh, you know he's uh, definitely trying to uh, push us you know away from the basic services the already underfunded services that we have access to here in this province he's saying that uh, you know we all need to get up off our ass well I'm so glad that we're all here together, online, in person, to tell him exactly where he needs to go. But that being said, friends, I think that's the best introduction I can give to our next speaker, uh, Andrea Italia, who is a musician and co-chair of the ODSP Action Coalition. And Andrea is going to be here to play some music for us. And then we'll begin with some more speeches.
Uh, so, yeah. Yay! Um, thanks to the cars, sometimes um, when you're when you're having a protest, you're the, con the cars honk their horn in solidarity. So you don't have to worry about that. It's just um, the cars. And, uh, and um, um, this song is called uh, Raised Rates, but which is uh, which is quite um, uh, coincidental with the name of the campaign that we have that's putting all this, these um, uh, actions together. But um, but I um, I just want to reiterate that everybody on ODSP is worthy and um, that they are important and that they are great. Um, that they're great and they deserve more money and they deserve um, better treatment than for this beginning. I just needed to counter his, uh, his, um, classism. So here we go. Oh, no. 
you so much, Andrea. Woo! And now, friends, Woo! I'd like to invite uh, Andrea's partner in crime, uh, Ron Ansich, the co-chair of ODSP Action Coalition. Hey everyone, nice to see you. I'm Ron, I'm the co-chair of the ODSP Action Coalition and also co-chair of the Race to Rates Coalition. I'm also an ODSP recipient, one of almost uh, half a million um, Ontarians with disabilities who are living in poverty. Our message is clear and urgent. Both, OD um, both ODSP and Ontario Works must be doubled immediately. Um, I don't like giving people a bunch of numbers, but in this case, uh, the numbers really do illustrate a harsh reality. The maximum ODSP payment for a single person is $1,368 a month. For Ontario Works, it's even less, $733 per month, and that's an amount that hasn't changed since Doug Ford came into office in 2018. Yay! Yay! Incidentally, if you adjust that for inflation, that's about $600 in 2018 money that people are getting on OW today. The average one-bedroom apartment in Toronto, or in Ontario, costs about $2,500 a month. Here in Toronto, the poverty line is $2,700 a month. Now, um, these aren't just numbers. Uh, they represent real people. They're your neighbors, your friends, and family members struggling daily to survive. Uh, nearly half of all ODSP applications are initially rejected, forcing many Ontarians with disabilities to rely on lower OW rates while they appeal or reapply. This traps people in a cycle of deep poverty. Living on ODSP or OW means impossible choices. Medication or groceries, heat or extra layers indoors, uh, a medical appointment or doing laundry. No one in a province as wealthy as Ontario should be forced to face these decisions. Doubling social assistance rates is not just about money, it's about dignity. It's about allowing people with disabilities and those in need to participate fully in society. It's about recognizing that neither disability nor temporary hardship diminishes a person's worth or their right to a decent life. Some people ask if we can afford to double ODSP rates. I ask whether we can afford not to. Uh, the cost of keeping people in poverty far exceeds the cost of lifting them out of it. Poverty leads to poorer health outcomes, increased health care costs, and lost economic potential. Doubling social assistance rates would mean affordable housing without sacrificing other basic needs, improved health through access to food and necessary medical supplies, increased community participation and potential employment and reduced strain on other social services like shelters and food banks. Over 50% of all regular food bank users in this province are social assistance recipients. The time for half measures is over. We need ODSB and OW rates doubled now. Not next year, not in five years, now. Every day that passes is another day that people with disabilities and those in need in Ontario are forced to live in poverty and make choices that no one should have to make. We're not asking for luxury, we're asking for the bare minimum needed to live with dignity. We're asking for the opportunity to, con to contribute to our communities, to pursue our goals, and to live rather than just survive. To those who say it can't be done, I say, look at the cost of inaction. Look at the human potential we're wasting. Look at the lives being lived in constant stress and depredation, and then tell me we can't afford to do better. Uh, finally, I call on everyone here and everyone listening to join us in this fight, contact your MPPs, speak out in your communities, share your stories and the stories of those you know. Make it impossible for the government to ignore us any longer. Together we can build a province where everyone, regardless of ability or circumstance, can live with dignity and hope. A province that truly cares for its most vulnerable. Let's make doubling ODSP in Ontario works a reality. The time for change is now. Thank you for listening.
Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you so much, folks, for being out here today. And uh, next, we're going to pass it to uh, uh, Scrap, who's going to speak about the intersections of supervised consumption sites and disability. frustrated with the narrative uh, from people who are against supervised consumption sites um, that rehab or forced treatment should be the only option for drug users. As a mad person, I was psychiatrically incarcerated a couple years ago and it ruined my life. It cost me my relationship, my friendship, and my housing. The referrals and follow-ups that I was promised by CAMH never happened. It did not save me. It just blew up my support system and led to me being homeless. Forced treatment is not treatment. It's incarceration and it's trauma. Forced rehab is anti-human rights, anti-bodily autonomy, and it's a paternalistic colonial view. We know ourselves best. We are making a choice that is not for others to take away. Caffeine, cigarettes, they're also harmful, but they're normalized. They're supervised consumption sites and the legality of drugs is based around stigma, around certain drugs. What makes your drug of choice so different? This is a 40 of whiskey. When I take a shot, I know that this is 40% alcohol. I know where it's from. I know it was bought from a known source. And somehow that is a privilege. I know how much it will take for me to kill the morning shakes. I know how much it will take how much I can drink safely. I can safely drink alone. Other users don't get that. And now you have supervised consu consumption sites, this one resource that people have to help themselves despite the poison drug supply being taken away. And the alternative being proposed is someone else in control of your life, taking your rights away, choosing if you live or die. We are not children. And we're under no illusion that drugs are good for us. We know they are dangerous, we know they are harmful. I know I will eventually die of liver disease. And we choose to use substances anyway. And that choice is ours, based on factors that no one else can evaluate but us. Rehab works for people if they choose to go. It does not work if you are forced into it. I have not seen a psychiatrist since I got formed at CAMH. How do you think that works for people who are forced into detox? And imagine being forced to deal with detox, withdrawals, shakes, nausea, vomiting, sweat, seizures, all of that, just to be released back into the very conditions that you started in, back into homelessness, back into abuse, back into the situation where you're using just to tolerate every other aspect of society leaving you for dead. You need to be alive to recover. You need to be alive to sober up. You need to be alive to get a job or get off social assistance and start making something of your life or whatever else people say. You need to be alive for everything that people are constantly yelling at marginalized people to do. Safe supply and harm reduction saves lives. It's called harm reduction for a reason. And if you're against harm reduction, you're saying that everybody who uses harm reduction services deserves harm. Not only that, but they, that they deserve the maximum harm. 
And we don't need people with a savior complex who think we need to be saved from ourselves. If you want to save people, If you want to save people, give them housing. Give them food. Give them health care. Give what people are actually asking for, not what you think we need. And when you see someone shooting up outside in an alley, which will only increase with a supervised consumption site's closing, are you actually in danger? Or are you just uncomfortable? Do you just not like seeing how our, how our society, our government, Doug Ford, has left people for dead, has left people with nothing, not even a safe place to use the drugs that dull the pain just a little bit? And what about the, the chronic pain that's caused by homelessness and trauma? My chronic pain has been so exacerbated by sleeping on the ground in a tent. And when marginalized people access doctors, we're not believed, we're turned away. So where does that leave us? When we need the system, it is not there. Closing supervised consumption sites, withholding, well, withholding everything else we need to live, then saying that we don't know how to help ourselves, that someone else needs to treat us against our will, is nothing more than a way to incarcerate already marginalized people. And to Doug Ford, I like to quote the song, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Don't fuck with people who have nothing left. We will fight back. Oh, that was actually a 750 milliliter bottle. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Close enough. All right, friends. I'm going to just take a quick look around here. We do have one other plan speaker. And I don't see them. That's okay. Now, I've been told, friends, that we have some folks from out of town who'd like to come up and have a bit of a word with folks. Uh, hello, I'm Daniel Ennett. This is Frederick Coach. Uh, we're a couple of Edmontonian filmmakers. Um, we're currently doing a series called The Crip Trip. Um, and kind of what the premise is, is that we are uh, road tripping across North America, by and large, uh, meeting with cool disabled people along the way uh, in an old 80s converted RV, which you can probably see parked down there. It's a massive eyesore. We had a bunch of graffiti on it. Um, we've been looking into interesting enclaves and disability communities uh, along the way, uh, meeting really cool people. Um, and something I've realized on this trip, you know, Toronto is kind of toward uh, the, the mid end point, is, uh, you know, the need for cross-provincial solidarity. Uh, the more I travel, even into the United States, the more I see how universal all of the issues that people with disabilities are facing, from lack of accessible housing to, uh, you know, getting gas lit during treatment, uh, to things like home care and the, the constant existential threat of institutionalization. Uh, these problems are so universal and it is saddening to me that, you know, when one of us makes progress in a certain province, we don't watch that change translate, uh, you know, across the country. Uh, so what I love to do in each place uh, I'm in is build networks and, and interact with organizations doing important work like tenants unions and DJNO and ODSP Action Coalition and uh, Toronto Disability Pride March. Uh, and thank you all so much for having us here and letting us get cameras in your faces. Um, it's been amazing seeing the amount of solidarity you guys have here in Toronto. 
and uh, the community here is really something to look up to for the rest of the country. And I'm hoping I can take some of the wisdom that's here uh, back to Alberta with me and we can start building bridges on some of these very important issues. So thank you all so much. And uh, I just wanted to reiterate what Danny's saying. Everything we heard here today is what we hear people saying in Edmonton. And I think that if we all find solidarity and fight together, we can change the system. Thank, thank you guys for being here, and let's all work together to, to change things, because things are not good where they're at right now. And there are some snacks and drinks over, over at the back. Come say hi. Thank you. Uh, so if you all want, that RV is full of graffiti. We've got spray cans in there if you want to deface it or add something. Uh, yeah. We have a door that you can sign if you would like. So if you feel like swinging by and adding your mark to this RV that's trudged us across the country, uh, please feel free to come say hi. Thanks. Well, friends, we're now at the close of the rally. Always a, a sad time when we get to bring everyone together. But um, I want to start by um, thanking everyone for coming. And to say that this, friends, is just the start. It has to be. This is just a spark of things to come. From everything the folks have said here today, I know it's clear that we need to take on this government and the ruling class through every means possible. You know, being here in front of a ministry that cuts against our interests and hold so much of our community's lives in their hands is important. But even rallies like this, friends, are not enough. We can write petitions, we can counter protest their events, we can apply pressure, pressure in countless ways, in person and online. Our communities are often left out of the conversations on how we can organize and build real movements and demand justice in broader organizing spaces. But we are in a province where this government and the ruling class attack our communities every day. And if you can believe that, I wrote that before Doug Ford opened his mouth this week. So it's like, you know, we don't even have to plan these things. We know already what they're going to say and how they're going to justify austerity and cuts and violence against our community. Oh, I hear it echoing a little, that's nice. Um, so friends, I hope that these stories and experiences and calls to action inspire us to keep going. And to show our power to Doug Ford and anyone who might replace him. Because the fact is, it could be Doug Ford today or someone else tomorrow, and we still have to fight together. <laughs> Finally, friends, let's take a bit of a wider view. Let's not forget that only about a week ago, many of us did come together, as we talked about a bit earlier, for the Grassy Narrows River Run. We walked with Grassy Narrows and demanded justice from both Ford and Trudeau for the mass disablement through mercury poisoning of the English Wabagoon River system for generations of Anishinaabe people. Hey. And I would hey. urge you, friends, I would urge you to continue this action, to keep the pressure up, and continue to fight for a free Grassy Narrows. But friends, what has the right-wing media focused on? Instead of talking about mass fucking disablement, we've been talking about attacking teachers and students and all of us for the obvious interconnectedness of struggles on Turtle Island and Palestine that brought together in this colonial racist environment the mass murder of Palestine and Palestinians, and a paired genocidal event, and a paired event of mass disablement. Hey. Hey. While it's really hard, apparently, for our premier 
and for much of the media and a lot of the political and ruling class to understand, even the youngest child can express solidarity with disabled Anishinaabe and Palestinians together. Instead, wider society seeks to bring them and us further violence. So friends, as a community, we have to resist that and fight back even louder, even harder. From Turtle Island to Palestine, we will fight all forms of colonial disablement and genocide. And friends, when we fight, we're gonna win. Thank you for coming, everyone. And let's keep on going. Also, friends, while you have a chance, please get some snacks. Please get some snacks. Thank you very much online folks.